In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, a reading from the mystical city of God by Venerable Mary of Agreda, Chapter 10. Christ our Savior is born of the Virgin Mary in Bethlehem, Judah. The palace which the Supreme King of Kings and the Lord of Lords had chosen for entertaining His eternal and incarnate Son in this world was a poor and insignificant hut or cave to which Most Holy Mary and Joseph betook themselves after they had been denied all hospitality and the most ordinary kindness by their fellow men, as I have described in the foregoing chapter. This place was held in such contempt that though the town of Bethlehem was full of strangers in want of night shelter, none would demean or degrade himself so far as to make use of it for a lodging, for there was none who deemed it suitable or desirable for such a purpose, except the teachers of humility and poverty, Christ our Savior and His purest Mother. On this account, the wisdom of the Eternal Father had reserved it for them, consecrating it in all its barrenness, loneliness, and poverty as the first temple of light. Malachi 4, 2, Psalms 3, 4. And as the house of the true Son of Justice, which was to arise from the upright of heart, from the resplendent aurora Mary, turning the night of sin into the daylight of grace. Most Holy Mary and St. Joseph entered the lodging thus provided for them, and by the effulgence of the ten thousand angels of their guard, they could easily ascertain its poverty and loneliness, which they esteemed as favors and welcomed with tears of consolation and joy. Without delay, the two holy travelers fell on their knees and praised the Lord, giving Him thanks for His benefit, which they knew had been provided by His wisdom and for His own hidden designs. Of this mystery, the heavenly Princess Mary had a better insight, for as soon as she sanctified the interior of the cave by her sacred footsteps, she felt a fullness of joy which entirely elevated and vivified her. She besought the Lord to bless with a liberal hand all the inhabitants of the neighboring city, because by rejecting her, they had given occasion to the vast favors which she awaited in this neglected cavern. It was formed entirely of the bare and coarse rocks, without any natural beauty or artificial adornment, a place intended merely for the shelter of animals, yet the Eternal Father had selected it for the shelter and dwelling place of His own Son. The angelic spirits, who like a celestial militia guarded their queen and mistress, formed themselves into cohorts in the manner of court guards in a royal palace. They showed themselves in their visible forms also to St. Joseph, for on this occasion it was befitting that he should enjoy such a favor, on the one hand in order to assuage his sorrow by allowing him to behold this poor lodging, thus beatified and adorned by their celestial presence, and on the other in order to enliven and encourage him for the events which the Lord intended to bring about during that night. And in this forsaken place, the great queen and empress, who was already informed of the mystery to be transacted here, set about cleaning with her own hands the cave, which was so soon to serve as a royal throne and sacred mercy seat. For neither did she want to miss this occasion for exercising her humility, nor would she deprive her only begotten son of the worship and reverence implied by this preparation and cleansing of his temple. St. Joseph, mindful of the majesty of his heavenly spouse, which it seemed to him she was forgetting in her ardent longing for humiliation, besought her not to deprive him of this work, which he considered as his alone. And he hastened to set about cleaning the floor and the corners of the cave, although the humble queen continued to assist him therein. As the holy angels were then present in visible forms, they were, according to our mode of speaking, abashed at such eagerness for humiliation, and they speedily emulated with each other to join in this work, 
or rather, in order to say it more succinctly, in the shortest time possible, they had cleansed and set in order that cave, filling it with holy fragrance. St. Joseph started a fire with the material which he had brought for that purpose. As it was very cold, they set at the fire in order to get warm. They partook of the food which they had brought, and they ate this, their frugal supper, with incomparable joy of their souls. The Queen of Heaven was so absorbed and taken up with the thought of the impending mystery of her divine delivery that she would not have partaken of food if she had not been urged thereto by obedience to her spouse. Narrator's Note I'm moving ahead now to section 475. The Most Holy Mary remained in this ecstasy and beatific vision for over an hour immediately preceding her divine delivery. At the moment when she issued from it and regained the use of her senses, she felt and saw that the body of the infant God began to move in her virginal womb. How, releasing and freeing himself from the place which in the course of nature he had occupied for nine months, he now prepared to issue forth from that sacred bridal chamber. This movement not only did not cause any pain or hardship, as happens with the other daughters of Adam and Eve in their childbirths, but filled her with incomparable joy and delight, causing in her soul and in her virginal body such exalted and divine effects that they exceeded all thoughts of men. Her body became so spiritualized with the beauty of heaven that she seemed no more a human and earthly creature. Her countenance emitted rays of light like a sun incarnadined and shone in the indescribable earnestness and majesty, all inflamed with fervent love. She was kneeling in the manger, her eyes raised to heaven, her hands joined and folded at her breast, her soul wrapped in the divinity, and she herself was entirely deified. In this position, and at the end of the heavenly rapture, the most exalted lady gave to the world the only begotten of the Father and her own, our Savior Jesus, true God and man, at the hour of midnight. At the end of the beatific rapture and vision of the mother, ever virgin, which I have described above, was born the Son of Justice, the only begotten of the Eternal Father and of Mary most pure, beautiful, refulgent, and immaculate, leaving her untouched in her virginal integrity and purity and making her more godlike and forever sacred. Chapter 11 The Holy Angels announce the birth of our Lord in different parts of the world, and the shepherds come to adore Him. After the courtiers of heaven had thus celebrated the birth of God made man near the portals of Bethlehem, some of them were immediately dispatched to different places in order to announce the happy news to those who, according to the divine will, were properly disposed to hear it. The holy Prince Michael betook himself to the holy patriarchs in limbo and announced to them how the only begotten of the Eternal Father was already born into the world and was resting, humble and meek, as they had prophesied, in a manger between two beasts. He addressed also in a special manner holy Joachim and Anne in the name of the Blessed Mother and had enjoined this upon him. He congratulated them that their daughter now held in her arms the desired of nations and him who had been foretold by all the patriarchs and prophets. Isaiah 7, 14, 9, 7, etc. It was the most consoling and joyful day which this great gathering of the just and the saints had yet had during their long banishment. All of them acknowledged this new God-man as the true author of eternal salvation. And they composed and sang new songs of adoration and worship in His praise. Saint Joachim and Anne enjoined the messenger of heaven, Saint Michael, to ask Mary their daughter to worship in their name the divine child, the blessed fruit of her womb, and this the great queen of the world immediately did for them, listening with great jubilee to all that the holy princess reported 
concerning the patriarchs of Limbo. Another of the holy angels that attended and guarded the Heavenly Mother was sent to St. Elizabeth and her son John. On hearing this news of the birth of the Redeemer, the prudent matron and her son, although he was yet of so tender an age, prostrated themselves upon the earth and adored their God made man in spirit and in truth. John 4, 23. The child which had been consecrated as his precursor was renewed interiorly with a spirit more inflamed than that of Elias, causing new admiration and jubilation in the angels themselves. St. John and his mother requested our queen through the angels that she, in the name of them both, adore her most holy son and offer him their services, all of which the heavenly queen immediately fulfilled. Other angels were delegated to bring the news to Zachary, Simeon, and Anne, the prophetess, and to some other just and holy people who were worthy to be trusted with this new mystery of our redemption. For as the Lord found them prepared to receive this news with gratitude and with benefit to themselves, he considered it a just due to their virtue not to hide from them the blessing conferred upon the human race. Although not all the just upon earth were informed at that time of this sacrament, yet in all of them were wrought certain divine effects in the hour in which the Savior of the world was born. For all the just felt in their hearts a new and supernatural joy, though they were ignorant of its cause. There were not only movements of joy in the angels and in the just, but also wonderful movements in the insensible creatures. For all the influences of the planets were renovated and enlivened. The sun much accelerated its course. The stars shone in greater brightness. And for the Magi kings was formed that wonderful star which showed them the way to Bethlehem. Matthew 2.2 2. Many trees began to bloom and others to produce fruit. Some temples of the idols were overthrown and in others the idols were hurled down and their demons put to flight. These wonders and other happenings in the world on that day men accounted for in different ways, but far from the truth. Only among the just there were many who by divine impulse suspected or believed that God had come into the world. Yet no one knew it with certainty except those to whom it was revealed. Among these were the three magi, to each of whom in their separate oriental kingdoms, angels of the Queen's Guard were sent to inform them by interior and intellectual enlightenment that the Redeemer of the human race had been born in poverty and humility. At the same time, they were inspired with the sudden desire of seeking Him and adoring Him, and immediately they saw the star as a guide to Bethlehem, as I will relate farther on. Amongst all these, the shepherds of that region, who were watching their flocks at the time of the birth of Christ, were especially blessed, Luke 2, 8. Not only because they accepted the labor and inconvenience of their calling with resignation from the hand of God, but also because, being poor and humble and despised by the world, they belonged in sincerity and uprightness of heart to those Israelites who fervently hoped and longed for the coming of the Messiah speaking and discoursing of him among themselves many times. They resembled the author of life as they were removed from the riches, vanity, and ostentation of the world and far from its diabolical cunning. John 10, 14. They exhibited in the circumstances of their calling the office which the good shepherd had come to fulfill in knowing his sheep and being known to them. Hence, they merited to be called and invited as the first fruits of the saints by the Savior Himself, to be the very first ones to whom the eternal and incarnate Word manifested Himself and by whom He wished to be praised, served, and adored. Hence, the archangel Gabriel was sent to them as they watched over the field, appearing to them in human form and with great splendor. The shepherds found themselves suddenly enveloped and bathed in the celestial radiance of the angel, and at his sight, being little versed in such visions, they were filled with great fear. The holy prince reassured them and said, Ye upright men, be not afraid, for I announce to you tidings of great joy, which is 
that for you is born today the Redeemer Christ our Lord in the city of David. And as a sign of this truth, I announce to you that you shall find the infant wrapped in swaddling clothes and placed in a manger. At these words of the angel suddenly appeared a great multitude of the celestial army, who in voices of sweet harmony sang to the Most High these words, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace to men of good will. Rehearsing this divine canticle so new to the world, the holy angels disappeared. All this happened in the fourth watch of the night. By this angelic vision, the humble and fortunate shepherds were filled with divine enlightenment and were unanimously impelled by a fervent longing to make certain of this blessing and to witness with their own eyes the most high mystery of which they had been informed. The signs which the holy angels had indicated to them did not seem appropriate or proportioned for attesting the greatness of the newborn to the eyes of the flesh. For to lie in a manger and to be wrapped in swaddling clothes would not have been convincing proof of the majesty of a king if these shepherds had not been illumined by divine light and been enabled to penetrate the mystery. As they were free from the arrogant wisdom of the world, they were easily made proficient in the divine wisdom, conferring among themselves the thoughts excited by this message. They resolved to hasten in all speed to Bethlehem and see the wonder made known to them by the Lord. They departed without delay, and entering the cave or portal, they found, as St. Luke tells us, Mary and Joseph and the infant lying in a manger. Seeing all this, they recognized the truth of what they had heard of the child. Upon this followed an interior enlightenment consequent upon seeing the Word made flesh. For when the shepherds looked upon him, he also glanced at them, emitting from his countenance a great effulgence, which wounded with love the sincere heart of each of these poor yet fortunate men. With divine efficiency, it changed them and renewed them, constituting them in a new state of grace and holiness and filling them with an exalted knowledge of the divine mysteries of the Incarnation and the redemption of the human race. Prostrating themselves on the earth, they adored the Word made flesh, not any more as ignorant rustics, but as wise and prudent men they adored Him, acknowledged and magnified Him as true God and man, as restorer and redeemer of the human race. The heavenly lady and mother of the child took notice of all that they did interiorly and exteriorly, for she saw into their inmost hearts in highest wisdom and prudence. She preserved the memory of all these happenings and pondered them in her soul. Luke 2, 19. Comparing them with the other mysteries therein contained and with the holy prophecies and sayings of the scriptures. As she was then the organ of the Holy Spirit and the representative of the infant, she spoke to the shepherds instructing and exhorting them to persevere in divine love and in the service of the Most High. They also conversed with her on their part and showed by their answers that they understood many of the mysteries. They remained in the cave from the beginning of dawn until midday, when, having given them something to eat, our great queen sent them off full of heavenly grace and consolation. Here ends our reading. Thanks be to God.